with the name of Allah, most beneficent and merciful, do we begin. With the permission of the President, the Honorable Mr. Justice Lakshmanan, seated to my left, I call this meeting to order. Mr. Justice Lakshmanan, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this meeting this evening is to give all our non-Muslim friends here an opportunity to hear something about Islam from one who is competent and knowledgeable in the subject with a view to dispelling wrong ideas, false notions and prejudices. <coughs> the distinguished speaker we have this evening is Dr. Zakir Naik to my right. Dr. Zakir Naik hails from Bombay. He is a doctor and a medical practitioner by training, by education and by profession. For the last several years, Dr. Zakir Naik has specialized in the mission of speaking on various aspects of Islam. He has distinguished himself in this work and he has spoken in several places all over the world and his tapes, his talks, his lectures, his cassettes are very much in demand. You can see some of them over here. He is the founder of the Islamic Research Foundation of Bombay, an organization which does a great deal to spread the true knowledge of Islam among non-Muslims and Muslims also, with a view to dispelling, as I said earlier, false ideas, prejudices and wrong notions perpetuated and propagated against Islam and Muslims with a view to disrupting communal harmony. The program for this evening will be as follows. The meeting proper will open with recitation from the Holy Quran by Master Kamil Abdullah. It will be followed by our President, the Honorable Mr. Justice Lakshman and address followed by our brother Muhammad Abdulari, Prince of our Court, in talk and remark, and thereafter Dr. Zakir Naik will speak. Before Dr. Zakir Naik speaks, I, I shall spell out, as desired by the organizers, the rules and norms whereby this meeting will conduct itself. Now, with the, with the permission of the President, I now request Master Kamil Abdullah to recite verses from the Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wal asr Innal insana lafi khusr إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. By the token of time through the ages, verily. Man is in loss, except such as have faith and do righteous deeds and join together with the mutual teaching of truth and patience and of constancy. I now request the Honorable Mr. Justice Lakshmanan of the Madras High Court to deliver his address. His Highness Nawab Muhammad Abdul Ali, Dr. Zahir Abdul Karim Naik, 
President of the Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai, Mr. Muhammad Abdullah Basha, Mr. Azam Paris, my revered friend, Mr. Faizur Rahman, other dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I thank the organizers of this function for having given me this opportunity to be in your midst and preside over this evening's present function. The preamble to our Constitution of India provides that we are secular in nature and character. The word secular has been introduced by the Constitution 42nd Amendment with effect from 3rd January 1977. Our secularism has always meant the concept of equal respect for all faiths and religions. It is also provided in the Constitution of India that no citizen shall be discriminated inter alia on the basis of religion. Right of religious minority has been recognized in Article 30 of the Constitution. Right of belief and propagation of religion has been given to the citizens under Article 25 of the Constitution. Thus, our Constitution recognizes the concept of equality, integrity, and unity of religious peace. I am sure that conference like this would go a long way in bringing about mutual respect and regard for persons following different religions in the larger interest of the great nation. Before I resume, I once again thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity to be in your midst this evening. When I was invited, I was asked to be there by our Highness Nawab Muhammad Abdul Ali. I was asked to be the chief guest. He is my revered and good friend. He immediately agreed. He told me that our Dr. Zagir Abdul Karim Naik will speak on focus on Islam and universal brotherhood. I have to, this morning I told him that I have another commitment by 8 o'clock, so I told him that I have to deny the pleasure of hearing his speech on focus on Islam and universal brotherhood. I, please pardon me, the uh, Dr. Zagir Hussain and my friend Faisal Rahman and our Muhammad Abdul Ali for not being able to be present here till the, the meeting is over. Anyhow, I have requested our Dr. Jagir Karim Naik. I am told that he is one of the very excellent and a very fine speaker on Islam, and he is going to his, make his speech, focus his speech on Islam and universal brotherhood. I have requested him to give me a, a, an audio cassette so that I can hear the speech and uh, give my opinions on that. With these few words, I thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity and meet the people who are present here in this evening's present function. Thank you all. We thank the Honorable Mr. Yassid Lakshmana for a thought-provoking and insightful speech which gives us much food for thought and reflection. On behalf of the organizers, I should like to make a request to our Muslim friends if they could please kindly cooperate and please make room for our non-Muslim friends and guests as this seminar is intended primarily for them, if they could please cooperate and make available some seats for our non-Muslim friends to comfortably sit down, please. Thank you very much.
The purpose of this meeting this evening is to promote inter-religious understanding. India being a country where many different kinds of people with different religious faiths live, it is of the utmost importance that we, at the very minimum, understand each other. The purpose of this evening's meeting is to enable our non-Muslim friends, at least some of them, to understand what exactly Muslims believe, why they believe in what they believe, and why their actions are to be explained very largely in terms of their religious beliefs. The distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, will speak very shortly on the topic for this evening being focus on Islam and Universal Brotherhood. His talk will be followed by a question and answer session. This question and answer session is intended exclusively for our non-Muslim friends. To our Muslim friends, I apologize for this. This is due to the extreme shortage of time. You have had opportunities in the past when Dr. Zakir Naik visited, and God willing, you will have opportunities again when Dr. Zakir Naik visits again. But this evening's meeting's question and answer session is exclusively for the benefit of our non-Muslim friends who are free to ask the, all the questions they wish. With these words, I now request Dr. Zakir Naik to please deliver his speech on Islam and Universal Brotherhood. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجنناكم شوبا وقبائل لتعرفوا إن فرمكم إن الله يتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشهى لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Honorable Justice Lakshmanan نواب محمد علي Brother Fayyaz, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty God be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is focus on Islam and universal brotherhood. <coughs> Islam comes from the root word Salam, which means peace. Islam also means submitting your will to Almighty God. So in short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have the misconception that Islam is a new religion which was found by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of the religion of Islam. In fact, the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, it says, there is not a nation or a tribe. There has never been a nation or a people to whom a warner has not been sent. The Quran says in Surah Rawl, chapter number 13, verse number 7, And to every nation and to every people have we sent a guide. That means there were messengers and guides sent to all the nations of the world. But by name, only 25 prophets of Almighty God are mentioned in the Holy Quran by name. For example, Adam, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Ishaq, Ismail, David, 
Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. By name, only 25 messengers are mentioned. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's mentioned the Hadith said that there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the Holy Quran. But all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people and the message was only meant for a particular time period. The messengers that came, they were only sent for their people and the message was only meant for a particular time period. But the Holy Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 40, it says, مَا قَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رُجَالِكُمْ وَلَا أَخِرْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمُ النَّبِيِّينَ That Muhammad is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the messenger of Almighty God and is the seal of the Prophet. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. The Holy Quran says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger that was sent on the face of the earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only for the Muslims or for the Arabs, but the Holy Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 170, says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the world, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. The Quran says in Surah Saba, chapter 34, verse number 28, illa bashira wa naziru, that we have sent thee, that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the humankind yet do not know. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, but he was sent for the whole of humanity. Many non-Muslims, they give another name for Islam, which they think is synonym, and they say the word Muhammadanism for Islam, and they call the Muslims as Muhammadan. This is the Westerners mainly. Islam and Mohammedanism is not the same. The religion of Islam cannot be called Mohammedanism because it was not a religion that was brought by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. As I said, it is there since time immemorial. The first Prophet was Prophet Adam peace be upon him. Muhammad sallallahu was not the first Prophet, he was the last Prophet. And the word Mohammedan means a person who worships Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. We Muslims respect him. But there is not a single Muslim who worships Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's not allowed in Islam. So the word Muhammadan is a misnomer. The right word for the religion is Islam, and the people who follow the religion of Islam are called as Muslims. Because a person who submits his will to Almighty God. We worship Almighty God and no one else. There were several revelations sent on the face of the earth to various nations and people. By name, only four are mentioned in the Holy Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. Furqan is the Holy Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation, which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation, which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation, which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that the Holy Quran, is the last and final revelation which was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger to the whole of humankind. By name, only four are mentioned in the Holy Quran. Otherwise, the Quran says there were several revelations sent on the face of the earth. For example, Sufa, Ibrahim, etc. Several. By name, only four are mentioned in the Holy Quran. All the revelations that came before the Holy Quran, they were only meant for a particular group of people and the message was supposed to be followed only for a particular time period. But the Holy Quran, it is mentioned in it, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number 52, that here is the message for the whole of humankind. Let them take warnings from, 
let them know there is only one God. And let the men of understanding take heed. The Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 185, that the Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as the guidance to the whole of humankind, as the criteria to judge right from wrong. The Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that we have revealed to thee, that's Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this book, the Holy Quran, to instruct the humankind. The Quran does not say to instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but the Quran says it was revealed for the whole of humankind. This is the last and final revelation of Almighty God. But there are many people who may not agree that the Holy Quran is a revelation from God Almighty. <coughs> the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 82, it says that Afala is the Barun al Quran. Walaqana min inti garilla. La bajidu fiqh zilaf and kafira. Do they not ponder over the Quran? That had it been from anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had it been from anyone besides Almighty God, there would surely have been contradictions in it. And I've given a talk in Bombay. Is the Quran the word of God? And it's available for sale outside. Where I've proved to Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that the Holy Quran is the word of Almighty God. Even to an atheist, I've proved it scientifically. But since the atheist doesn't believe in God Almighty, how will he agree that the Quran is the word of God Almighty? If he doesn't believe in God, so where does the question arise in him believing that the Quran is the word of God? So normally when an atheist comes and tells me that I do not believe in Almighty God, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. I congratulate him. You know why? Because he's thinking. The other people, the Christian, most of the Christians are Christian because the father is a Christian. He is a Muslim because father is a Muslim. He is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. They are just following blindly the religion of the father. This atheist is thinking. So what he thinks? That see what is the concept of God told by my father. It's not right, so he doesn't believe in God Almighty. And I congratulate him because he has said the first part of the Islamic creed, the first part of the Islamic shahada, la ilaha, that there is no God. He has agreed with the first part of the Islamic creed which says la ilaha, there is no God. Now my job is to convince him is on the other part, illallah, but Allah. The Islamic creed is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. That there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So since the atheist has said the first part, I congratulate him. Now it's my job to convince him about the second part, but Almighty God, which I shall do inshallah. When you ask a person who doesn't believe in God Almighty, that if an object, a machine, is born in front of him, which no human being in the world has ever seen. An unidentified machine, which no one in the world has seen before, if it's brought in front of him. And if he's asked that who is the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that machine? What's the answer that atheists will give you? Some atheists may say that the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that unidentified machine, which no one in the world has seen before, is the creator. Some may say manufacturer, some may say producer, some may say maker. Whatever they say, keep it in mind. It will be somewhat similar. The first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this unidentified machine, which no one in the world has seen, is the creator or maker or manufacturer or producer. Whatever it is, it will be somewhat similar. If you ask the question to the atheist, who believes that science is ultimate, that how did our world come into existence? He will tell you that according to the Big Bang Theory, first, the whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies, to planets, to sun, the moon, and the earth we live in. In a nutshell, the theory is called as Big Bang Theory. The same message is given in the Holy Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, 
وان کا متھا چیلی سے اولم یر اللذین اقفرو ان سماوات والارض کانت رتکن فتقنا ہما that do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder so when you ask the atheist that who could have written this big bang theory which we discovered yesterday in the holy quran 1400 years ago he may say it's a guess can be possible someone guess or some intelligent man wrote it no problem today science tells us that the universe initially the celestial matter was in the form of gas the quran says in surah fusilat chapter 41 verse number 11 that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had turned to the heavens when it was smoke and it said to it and the earth come eat together willingly or unwillingly and they came together in willing obedience so quran says that first the celestial matter was in the form of dukhan the arabic word dukhan means smoke which science today tells us that smoke is a more appropriate word than gas. Who could have mentioned that initially the celestial matter was in the form of smoke? Let it just say, okay, someone has guessed it, no problem. Previously we thought that the world we live in, it was flat. And people were afraid to venture too far, lest they would fall over. You ask the atheist, that what is the shape of the earth, so he will tell you the shape of the earth is spherical. If you ask him that when did you come to know about this, so he will tell you that 50 years back, 100 years back, means yesterday in science. 50 years means yesterday in science. Who was the first person? If he has good knowledge about science, he will tell you. The first person who discovered that the world was spherical was the Francis Drake in 1597 when he sailed around the earth and he proved it was spherical. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 29, and in Surah Azumul, chapter 39, verse number 5, that Allah merges the night unto the day, and merges the day unto the night. Allah overlaps the day unto the night, and overlaps the night unto the day. This overlapping and merging, which is a gradual and slow process of day changing to night, and night change to day, is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical. It's not possible if it's flat, otherwise there would have been a foreign change. So Quran speaks about the spherical nature of the earth 400 years ago. Quran further says in Surah Nasiyat, chapter 79, verse number 30, And thereafter, we have made the earth X-shaped. The Arabic word dahaha also means expand, and also means it comes from the root word duya, which means X. It does not refer to a normal egg, it refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the earth, it is not round like a ball. It is flattened from the top and bulging from the center. Similar to the shape of the egg of an ostrich, which is too flattened from the top and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. So you are the here that who could have mentioned that the earth is geospherical 1400 years ago which we discovered just 300, 400 years ago. The person may say, maybe your prophet, he was an intelligent man, he wrote it, don't argue. Continue. Previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. It's recently we discovered that the light of the moon is reflected light. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who has created the constellation in the sky and therein placed a lamp, a sun, having a light of its own and a moon having borrowed light. So Quran says the light of the sun is its own light. But the moon light, the light of the moon is not its own. The light of the moon is described as munir or nur, which means borrowed light or reflection of light. The sunlight is described as a ferai or a wahai, or diya, that means a light of its own, meaning a torch or a glory lamp. But always the moonlight is described as munir or nur. Imagine we discovered it just yesterday in science, 50 years back, 100 years back, and Quran mentions this 400 years ago. When I was in school I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis, whereas the moon and the earth they rotate about their own axis. But there's a verse in the Holy Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, 
was the three الذي خلق الليل والنهار والشمس والقمر كل من في فلك يسبحون that it is Allah who has created the night and the day the sun and the moon each one traveling in orbit with its own motion the Quran says that the sun and the moon besides revolving they also rotate about their own axis which later on we have come to know recently after I passed school I came to know that science has discovered that even the sun rotate about its own axis which was mentioned in this holy Quran 14 years ago who could have mentioned this now he will hesitate to say it's a fluke or it's just by chance the Quran speaks about the water cycle the first person to describe the coherent water cycle was Sir Bernard Parisi in 1580 Quran describes the details of the water cycle in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Rum, chapter 30, verse 24. In Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse 22. In several places, the Quran describes the water cycle in great detail. How does the water evaporate? How does it form into clouds? How does the cloud move into the interior? And how does it fall down as rain and goes back into the ocean? The water cycle has been described in great detail in the Holy Quran, which was just discovered recently. Previously, we did not know there were two types of water, salt and sweet water. The Holy Quran tells us in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palpable, the other salt and bitter. Between them there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The same message is repeated in Surah Rahman chapter 55, verse number 19 and 20, that Maraj al Bahraini al Taqyan, Bainama Barzakhullayakyan, that it is Allah who has led for two bodies of flowing water. And between them there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today science tells us that the sweet and salt water, though they meet, they do not mix. There is a slanting barrier between them which the Quran described 400 years ago. When you ask the atheist, who could have mentioned this? He will hesitate to say that it's a problem. The Quran speaks about biology. It says in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, Wajalna min al ma'i kulla shayn hai, that they've created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, where there was scarcity of water, the Quran says, every living thing is made from water. Who would have believed in this fairy tale? Where there was scarcity of water, the Quran says, every living thing is made of water. Today we have come to know, the basic unit of cells, the cytoplasm, it contains 80% water. Every living creature contains 50-90% water. Quran says that the plants were created in males and females, in sexes which we discover today. Quran speaks about zoology, about the lifestyle of the bird, lifestyle about the ant, of the spider, of the bees, which we discover today. Quran speaks about medicine, that in the honey there is a healing which we discover today. Quran speaks about embryology, the various stages of embryological development of the human being, which we discover today. Quran speaks about genetics. If you ask the atheist, that who could have mentioned all this? He cannot say it by chance because there is a theory known as theory of probability. The chances of it being a guesswork, it becomes less the moment you give more correct answers. Theory of probability. So surely the only answer that is remaining is the first answer which he gave. Who can tell the mechanism of the universe? Is the creator. Is the manufacturer. Is the producer. Is the maker. You can call him by any name, but there is a creator which we call as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Almighty God. How to prove that Quran is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How to prove scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You can refer to my video cassettes, Quran and modern science, conflict or confidation, where I've spoken in detail. Our beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number seven, that Islam is based on five principles on five pillars. The first is the Tawheed. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. 
that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran says in Surah al baqarah chapter 2, verse number 177, it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, Almighty God. You believe in the hereafter, you believe in the angels, you believe in the messengers, and you believe in the books. The best definition that a Muslim can give you of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is from the Holy Quran, from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul huwallahu ahad. Say he is Allah by and only. Allah who summoned. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Wa lam kufan ahad. And there is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. What the Muslims say, if any person, any entity, you claim to be Almighty God, if it fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as Almighty God. But the Holy Quran also says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 110, it says, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayat Ma'atadu, Falaul Asma al Hasna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. That means you can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Almighty God by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And the Holy Quran gives no less than 99 different attributes to Almighty God. Al Rahim, Al Rahman, Al Jabbar, Al Kahar, Al Qudud. No less than 99 different attributes to Almighty God. He's merciful, He's beneficent, etc., etc. But the crowning one is Allah. Now why we Muslims prefer calling Almighty God by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? The reason we Muslims prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah because the English word God it can be played around with. You can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if you add an S to God it becomes God. In Islam, there's nothing like Allah. There's no plural of Allah. Qul wallahu ad. Say it Allah one only. If you add B E S S to God, it becomes goddess, meaning a female god. In Islam, there's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. He's unique. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. That is my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you add a mother to Allah, to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. If you prefix a tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. Therefore, we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic word Allah than by the English word God. Otherwise, the Holy Quran says, you can call him by any name. Besides for the Isra chapter 17 verse 110, it's also mentioned for the Araf chapter 7 verse 180. In Surah Taha chapter 20 verse number 8, and Surah Al-Hashar chapter 59 verse 24, that you can call Allah by any name, but to him belongs the most beautiful name. It should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And the Holy Quran further says, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 108, that revile not those who worship God besides Allah. That means abuse not those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance they will revile, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a Muslim is prohibited from abusing those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu the second pillar of Islam is Salah. Many people translate the word Salah as prayer. To pray means to ask for help, to beseech. How a person beseech in a court of law, to ask for help. Prayer does not denote 
the complete meaning of the Arabic word Salah. Because in Salah, besides asking for help, we also praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also get guidance in the Salah. So therefore, the English word prayer does not denote the complete meaning of the Arabic word Salah. The more appropriate meaning that I say, I prefer calling it as programming. Because the Muslims, we are programmed in a Salah. We are programmed what is wrong, what is right. Do the good things, don't do the bad things. Don't drop. Don't cheat. Do the good things. Love your neighbor. Etc. etc. We are being programmed. But if someone tells me where am I going and if I say I'm going for programming, I'm going for brainwashing, it may sound odd. So if someone uses the word prayer for salah, I've got no objection. Though it does not denote the complete meaning of the Arabic word salah, but if someone says where are you going, and instead of saying for prayer, you say I'm going for programming, I'm going for brainwashing, it will sound a bit odd. So if anyone uses the word prayer for salah, I've got no objection. We Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day. In the morning, before sunrise, it is the Fajr Salah. The Zohar Salah, after the sun reaches its highest point, that's early in the afternoon. The Asr Salah, late in the afternoon, that's before the sun sets. The Maghrib Salah, after the sun sets immediately. And the Isha Salah, that's late in the evening or early in the night. We have to pray minimum five times a day. How for a healthy body, the doctor will tell you, you should minimum have three meals a day. Similarly, for a spiritual soul, you should offer salah five times a day minimum. And whenever we offer salah, when we enter the mosque, we always remove our footwear. This was a commandment given to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran, in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 11 and 12 that when he approached the fire, he heard a voice, O Moses, verily I am your Lord. Take off thy shoes, for thou art in the sacred valley of Tuwa. This was the commandment given to Musa a.s., which we Muslims follow. We take off our footwear when we offer salah. Besides that, we are hygienic people. We want to see that a place of worship is clean, and since we do prostration, we don't want to prostrate in mud, dirt and filth, which comes along with the footwear. We are hygienic people. Before offering salah, the Holy Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 5, that Ya Ayyuhal Latina Aman, O you who believe, when you prepare yourself for salah, when you prepare yourself for prayer, wash your hands, wash your face and your hands and arms up to the elbow, rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankle. It's the ablution. In Arabic it's called as wudu. It's compulsory that before we offer salah, we should do ablution, we should wash ourselves. Because we're hygienic people. We want to be clean before we appear in front of the Lord. And besides that, it's also a mental preparation. That mentally we have been prepared that now we are going to appear in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of Almighty Lord. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Bukhari, volume number one. In the book of Adan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, a prophet said that when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. And the hadith says, when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder so that the devil does not come in between you. Our prophet was not talking about the devil which you see in the Onida TV ad. No Onida TV ad, it has the devil with two horns and a tail. Our prophet was not talking about the devil which you see in the Onida TV ad or in the comic strip with two horns and a tail. He was referring to the devil of racism, devil of casteism, devil of color, of wealth. Means irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, whether you're from America or from China or from India or from Pakistan, whether you are from a noble family or not a noble family. When you are for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. So that it shows the best universal brotherhood, five times a day. Five times a day when we offer salah, irrespective from whichever part of the world is coming, whether it's rich or poor, whether it's black or white, when they stand for salah, we Muslims, we stand shoulder to shoulder. Universal brotherhood. The best example, practical example. 
So that's the devil of racism, the devil of color, the devil of caste, the devil of wealth does not come in between the brothers. And the best part of Allah is the sujood, is the prostration. The Arabic word sujood is mentioned in the Holy Quran no less than 92 different times. And the psychology will tell us that the mind is not directly under control. The body is directly under control, but the mind keeps on wandering. It's not directly under control. It keeps on wandering. The body is directly under control. So to humble the mind, you have to humble the body. And which is a better way than the way we Muslims do? We put the highest part of the body, that's the forehead, lowest part on the ground, and then say, glory be to Allah, who's the most greatest. Glory be to Allah, who's the most highest. And if you analyze that when we offer Salah, there are various benefits of Salah, that is prayer. Normally, throughout the day, there are electrostatic charges given out from the pain. Going to sujood, these charges get grounded. There's dominance of the frontal lobe. There's grounding of these charges. How you have a three-pin plug and a two-pin plug? The three-pin plug ground. That does not mean if you put a hand below the head, you will fight, you will get a shock. It's not that grounding as the electricity grounding, but it's dominant from the frontal lobe. Normally, when you live, you always stand erect. Blood is being pumped by the heart to the brain, but it is not sufficient for a very healthy brain. So when you sujood, extra blood flows from the heart into the brain due to gravity. This extra flow of blood is a requirement for a very healthy brain. So when to sujood, extra blood flows into the brain which is very good for a healthy brain. When to sujood, there is extra blood supplied to the skin of the face which prevents chill pain. Where to sujood, the secretion of the sinuses, the ethmoidal sinus, the maxillary sinuses, they get drained. There's less chances of a person suffering from sinusitis. Normally, when you breathe, only two-thirds of your lung capacity is utilized. The remaining one-third is known as residual air. But when you sujood, and when you breathe in the sujood, the abdominal viscera, it presses against the diaphragm. The diaphragm presses against the lower part of the lungs, and even the residual air, the one-third air, is exhaled out. So more fresh air enters into the lungs, in which there are less chances of that person suffering from lung disease. Where to sujood, there is drainage of secretion of the bronchial tree, in which there is less chances of a person suffering from bronchiectasis. Where to sujood, there is increased venous return to the abdominal viscera. Where to sujood, there is less chances of having hernia. Where to sujood, there is less chances of having hemorrhoids. There are several benefits. Where to Qayyam Ruku Sujood, when you stand up and when you get up in a certain position, the calf muscles are being activated. The calf muscles are referred to as the peripheral heart because they supply blood to the lower part of the body. So when you do Qayyam Ruku Sujood, when you stand up, sit up, prostrate, get up, the calf muscles are activated and it increases the blood supply to the lower part of the body. When you stand up, bow down and prostrate, the vertebra is being exercised. You have less chances of having disease of the vertebra. There are several medical benefits only of Salah. You can give a talk only on that. But we Muslims, we don't offer Salah for these medical benefits. These are only side dishes. We offer Salah to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a main dish. That's a biryani. The medical benefits are side dishes. We don't pray for these medical benefits. It may attract a person who does not believe in Islam, that okay, you get medical benefits, he may come closer to Salah. But the Muslims, we offer Salah to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to praise Him. That's a main biryani. This is additional benefit which Allah gives us. The third pillar is zakat. The Arabic word zakat means purification. It means growth. In Islam, every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than the minimum wealth, that is seven and a half dollar gold, he should give 2.5% of that 
savings every lunar year in charity. And the criteria to which it can be given is given in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, which says it can be given to the fuqara, to the poor people, to the masakin, to the needy, to those whose hearts are bent towards Islam, those who are in debt, those in frame of slaves, a wayfarer who gets stranded in a foreign land, and those who spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are eight categories given in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, to whom the zakat can be given. It's compulsory. That every rich Muslim who has a saving of more than the nisab level, he should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. Now the question, that if every human being in the world gives zakat, gives 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. That's why the Holy Quran says in Surah Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 7, that it prevents the wealth from circulating amongst the rich, so that the rich don't become more rich. It prevents the wealth from circulating amongst the rich. The Holy Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34, that those who bury gold and silver, who bury the wealth, gold and silver, and spend it not in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not give charity. Announce to them a grievous penalty that on the day of judgment, heat will be produced from this wealth, from the fire of hell, and they will be branded on the forehead, on the flanks, on the back, and it will be told to them that you hoarded the wealth, now have a taste of your wealth. Hoarding of wealth is prohibited in the Holy Quran. You cannot hold wealth. The fourth pillar is Hajj. Every adult Muslim, every adult Muslim who has the means to perform Hajj, that the pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah should at least do it once in his lifetime. And I say that the Hajj is the best practical example in the world of universal brotherhood. There is not a better example in Hajj. There are 2.5 million Muslims who gather in Mecca, in Mina, in Arafat, the Holy Land, 2.5 million Muslims from various parts of the world, from America, from England, from Japan, from India, from Pakistan, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from various parts of the world, and the men, they dress up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. They dress up in the same attire, two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. So that the person standing next to you, when he's performing the pilgrimage, you cannot make out whether the person standing in front of you is a king or a pauper. You cannot come to know whether he's rich or poor. All of the Muslims from various parts of the world, they collect, it's the biggest annual gathering of the world. 2.5 million Muslims, 25 lakh Muslims, they gather there and they perform the pilgrimage and they're dressed in the same simple, unsoon pieces of cloth. Best example of universal brotherhood. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuhan nafu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum, shawban wa qaba'ila lit'arafu, inna akramakum, in the lahi atkaakum, in the laha alimun khabeel. That old mankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and I have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness, who has God consciousness, who has piety. The Holy Quran says that the whole of humankind have been created from a single pair of male and female. And God Almighty has divided them into nations and tribes so that they shall recognize each other, not that they shall despise each other, that I am superior to you or you are superior to me. And a prophet said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. Neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. Neither is a white superior to a black, nor a black superior to the white. And the Quran says, the only criteria for judgment in Surah Hujurah, chapter 49, verse number 13, 
the only criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not sex, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not age, it is taqwa. It's God consciousness, it's piety, it's righteousness. The only way a person can be more superior than the other human being is by piety, it is by righteousness, it is by God consciousness, not by wealth, color, or by nobility. These are the guidance given the Holy Quran for universal brotherhood. The fifth pillar is Ramadan, a song that every adult Muslim should fast, should abstain from having food and drink from sunrise to sunset in the complete lunar month of Ramadan. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse 183, that Ramadan has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed earlier to the people who came early, before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. The reason for fasting has been described in the Holy Quran for self-restraint. And the psychology is tell us today that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desire. That's what the Quran says. Ramadan has been prescribed for you so that you may learn self-restraint. You may control your desire. If you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various benefits. That if a person can abstain from having alcohol from sunrise to sunset, he can very well abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. If he can abstain from smoking from sunrise to sunset, he can very well abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. It gives you an opportunity to improve yourself. I call it the overhauling, like how every machine requires servicing. Like you service your car every three months, every four months, your motorcycle every five months, etc. If you allow me to call the human being the machine, I would say it is the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. Ramadan is a servicing of the human body. One lunar month, every lunar year. Servicing. There are several medical benefits, even of Salah. I wouldn't like to go into the details, but it also improves, increases the intestinal absorption. When you fast, it increases the intestinal absorption. These were in a nutshell, the five pillars of Islam. If you remember, the Prophet said, these are the pillars of Islam, these are the principles of Islam. This does not constitute the complete Islam. Many people are misunderstanding that if they do these five things, they become very good Muslims. These are only the five pillars. And any engineer will tell you that if the pillar is strong, then hopefully the structure will be strong. If the foundation is strong, the structure will be strong. So if you follow these five pillars correctly, then inshallah the structure will be correct. And the other structure, the do's and don'ts, I mentioned the Holy Quran. How a person should lead his life, I mentioned the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created the jinn and the men, not but to worship me. That means God Almighty created the jinn and the men only to worship me. What is the meaning of the Arabic word ibadah? It comes from the root word abd, which means slave, which means servant. Ibadah means serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, means following His commandments. Many people have misconception that salah, prayer, is the only form of ibadah. Salah is one of the high forms of ibadah, but it's not the only form of ibadah. Whatever commandments you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you follow them, you are doing ibadah. If you abstain from prohibited food, like alcohol, Quran says in Surah Maidah chapter 5 verse number 90, that alcohol is prohibited, you are doing ibadah of Almighty God. If you're honest in your business, you're doing ibadah, you're doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you love your neighbor, as the Quran says in Surah Ma'un chapter 107, verse number 1 to 7, that provide neighborly meat, you're doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you abstain from backbiting, speaking ill about people behind the back, you're doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says in Surah Humza, chapter 104, it says, وَيْلُلْ لِقُلْ لِهُمَّ زَتِلْ 
that would to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. Quran says in Surah Hujurah chapter 49 verse number 11 and 12 that do not defame others, do not be sarcastic, do not call others by nickname. Avoid suspicion, for suspicion in many cases is a crime. Do not speak ill about other people behind the back. Are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? Means if you backbite, if you speak ill about anybody else behind the back, it is as though you are eating the dead meat of your brother. 